If you're given a cancer diagnosis, there is so much going through your head and so many questions on treatment, recovery, options, and more. So today, Dr. Yoon Han Kim, Chief Wellness Officer, will talk about patient-centered care in integrative oncology and what it means. Welcome to a podcast presented by Memorial Hospital. I'm Maggie McKay. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kim. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share and shed some uh, light into this very important uh, topic. Would you please tell us what patient-centered care in integrative oncology is, its role, and what kind of cancers we're talking about today? So the majority of cancer that we see here would be breast cancer. Um, And the patient-centered care means that uh, we want the patient have full and um, fully empowered. We want patients to. Um, one of my mentors, Dr. Bernie Siegel, who invented uh, integrative oncology before they called it that, um, he said that statistics are for dead people. And as long as you're alive, the biology of the individual versus the pathology of the disease, um, you have to allow for the biology of individuals to be optimized. So for me, the patient-centered care means just that. We want our patients to be fully, fully empowered and fully mindful every stage they make decision. And what is emphasized? What kind of services are offered? So the most important actually is to understand where they are in the cancer journey. So I had a patient that was making crucial decisions whether to have radiation therapy or not. And it became um, very much a discussion and education. In this patient's case, it was on the left-hand side. And when I was um, working at Miami Cancer Institute, uh, I've learned that the left-sided breast cancer, that having a uh, proton therapy has advantage because it will avoid hitting the heart. So we we discussed that. We discussed uh, there was an article that was talking about the importance of chemotherapy starting, uh, I'm sorry, radiation therapy starting within certain uh, frame uh, of time so that that person would get the best optimal results. So um, initially, I think the patient if you just left it to her decision, would not have considered uh, a lot of my patients are looking for alternative to conventional treatment. What I share with them is that in stages uh, one and two and three, utilizing the full resources of conventional medicine is helpful. So we looked at the evidence and it was, it was through many uh, conversations and the patient, uh, and I'm very proud of her, Cho- chose to go ahead and get proton therapy. And um, once that was done, we, we talked about how do we um, assist her immune system to give her the best chances of survival. So it sounds like very in-depth consultations. You spend a lot of time. It's in-depth, and that's why we have a uh, nurse navigator. Ruth uh, Ferndig is our oncology nurse navigator who Uh, checks in with our patients and uh, helps that communication between the patient and me. I think it's so interesting that you utilize everything, acupuncture, lifestyle medicine, resiliency training. What is resiliency training? So resiliency training, I think, um, is that anything that helps patients to cope, survive, and thrive the experience of cancer and acupuncture actually is a fantastic service because when, if the patients have nausea, if patients have fatigue, uh, I actually have means to offer them effective uh, pain relief, uh, nausea, or fatigue. So we, if they feel better, they're not in pain and feel better, um, I was told by palliative care physicians that their patients seem to live longer. So I took a hint from that. So what I do is just that. And then the resiliency portion is what Dr. Bernie Siegel, um, I learned from him, and that is to empower patients with things that they're willing to do, able to do. Uh, If music helps, then music can help. Uh, Acupuncture can help. Breathing can help. Um, 
relaxation response, which is a technique that is uh, developed by the late uh, Dr. Benson uh, from Harvard and mindfulness techniques. It, it really, uh, to me, it doesn't matter. It's what gives patient uh, the peace and the will to uh, continue and, and get the best optimal results. Right, because everybody's different and responds differently and has different interests, right? Yoga, meditation, music therapy, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, how important is communication between the patient and the physician? Because let's say a patient is doing some alternative medicine that they don't tell you about. I mean, it seems to me you need good communication to know everything that they're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the advantages I have is that they know I'm an integrative medicine uh, expert, integrative oncology expert. And what that means to that patient is that they feel safer to tell me uh, what's going on. And, and, and I also don't normally discuss their treatment courses uh, when they first come. I just want to know what they're doing and I want to know everything they're doing. So one example I had was that a patient um, from Europe was an herbalist and when her uh, husband had a uh, serious cancer, she decided to use serious herb known as wolf's vein or aconite. Well, if you give it to people, they die. So I was able to talk to her and say, yes, uh, wolf's vein or aconite is very powerful. And in Chinese medicine, they process it so that people won't die. But by the way, did you know this weekend, that there were two people hospitalized in San Francisco herbal shop drinking aconite. And by accident, they had some of the unprocessed aconite. One person died and one person was in critical condition. So then um, she said, oh, I'm glad I told you. Otherwise, I was going to just not tell him and give it to him. I said, well, in this country, that can be viewed as murder. Right. Wow. That's a good point, too. How do you treat patients' pain? So pain-wise, uh, the pain is very personal, subjective experience. So some people do well uh, with acupuncture. Some people do well with uh, what we call uh, self-regulation techniques like self-hypnosis, guided imagery. Um, relaxation response is uh, superb also. And the other part is that pain is sensation of what we call nociceptive or irritating or um that stimuli that's not pleasing. But there's a second portion of that called the brain response, which is brain is organizing that. So that um, so the tools, how you treat it, and then there is also a technique known as a pain reprocessing therapy, which is not helpful for acute pain phase, but if they develop chronic pain, um, then the that's also a useful way, which is reframing within your brain to uh, to to say that uh, yes i hurt uh, no i'm not in critical danger uh, and then learning ways to communicate with pain to stand it down so we're not looking for 100 percent pain relief we are looking for about 50 percent pain relief dr kim what's considered alternative cancer treatments and is there evidence that it helps so alternative is anytime someone is doing something that's not chemotherapy, that's not surgery, um, and uh, that is uh, not radiation therapy. And the alternative approach to cancer, in my opinion, uh, what I have seen and read, there are very, uh, there's not a systemic study that shows clear answer that something works. And what I, what I share with patients is that, that cancer is such a big problem and big business. You have to remember things like Taxol comes from nature. It comes from uh, Pacific yew tree. There are uh, treatments that are uh, products of nature that we have uh, learned from and then improve to create uh, answers to cancer. So the, uh, the, the area of oncology, the pharmacologists, uh, they are looking for answers from everywhere. So if something works, you can be sure that they've looked into it, they're looking at it. Curcumin, uh, there was a lot of studies uh, that show promise that turmeric product curcumin was helpful. And then it was later shown that one of the, uh, the researchers involved, Dr. Agarwal, uh, was so 
empathetic and believed it so much that uh, he fudged data. So that uh, that sometimes happens. And there are many examples where in the initial studies, things look very promising. Uh, and that happens with chemotherapy too. And then when you do a uh, like phase three trial or multi-center trial, then it doesn't look as convincing. So the part of the, um, the, the, the truth about uh, cancer is that it, it's not an easy disease to treat. Um, and right now, I would say some of the more miraculous things that we have seen is like our president, the past president, Jimmy Carter. When I read that he had a, a metastasis to the brain, I, I thought that there was no way that he could make it, except I read that uh, that the molecular profile of the cancer matched a brand new medication immunotherapy known as Keytruda. And then I said, aha, now I think his chances of making it is pretty good. And he, he is still surviving. So I think that it is just really important that that you have to do the right thing for that individual. And, um, and I have some patients who decide to go against, and I tell them that uh, my recommendation is at least do the surgery because cancer does not belong in your body. And then, uh, and then if you don't want to do other things, let's talk about it. And one of the things we really talk about uh, communication and trust is that ask your oncologist, radiation oncologist, what we call attributable risk or attributable benefit, meaning how much do I, would I, not I, but could, how much would one in my condition benefit by doing the chemotherapy, radiation therapy versus not doing it? And they know the answer. And if you don't ask it, if you say, how much would I benefit? They'll say, I don't know, <laughs> because that's true. But if you say, how much would one, someone like me in my position in general benefit from a treatment like chemotherapy, radiation therapy. And I think that then they're better in position to um, say, I think it's, you know, you, not you, but in general, it would be about this much. And it's not an exact number. You mentioned risk factors. Can, mm -hmm. can they be modified, any of them? So I think that, um, that there are genetic cancers, but fortunately the genetic cancers actually are, are versus uh, environmental uh, factors. I think that it is, it is um, highly uh, in favor of uh, non-genetic cancers. So that means that uh, it should be modifiable. And we do know that, that if someone had a cancer and they, they're obese versus non-obese, the difference is that the likelihood the obese patient will get a metastatic disease, stage four disease, that's usually uh, not as likely to survive over a long time. And a local recurrence, the local recurrence more likely in non-obese uh, women. So we know just that example, that even a, sim that a simple, I call it simple because it's very measurable, um, very concrete, being obese, non-obese appears to make a difference in recurrence of cancer. And we do know that, uh, so I think that's one example where we're seeing that behavioral lifestyle um, and toxin exposure all uh, would matter. How do you feel about um, hypnosis and support groups? Useful? So there is a study by uh, Dr. Spiegel in Stanford University when uh, fake stage four cancer patients were um attending support group, they got to live, uh, I believe, a, about a year longer than uh, people who aren't doing that. So if you had a brand new medication that said, if you take this, you'll live longer, there's no side effect, you will feel better, you will make some friends, you would think that people would be really, really enthusiastic. Uh, but I think that in our society, that so, so the, the support groups are not always uh, successful. So there's evidence, um, not very strong evidence, but there's uh, some evidence that support group for cancer patients may be helpful. And then for hypnosis, um, I'm not aware of trials they've done, but I use hypnosis for discomfort. So for example, I had a patient that had deathly ill of going into uh, machines and uh, it got in the way of his uh, radiation therapy. So we did uh, self-hypnosis. We taught him how to do self-hypnosis. 
and he didn't have any issues uh, with that. Wow. So he could do the tests after that? That's mm-hmm. great. He could, he, could, he could get his radiation therapy without um, without being in a massive panic attack. That's amazing. You can't move. If you move, other things will get burned. So uh, he once uh, we did acupuncture and we 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 did uh, uh, we taught him how to do self hypnosis. He did fine. That's amazing. Um, talk about stress a little bit. I mean, of course, we know it affects everything, but how can we limit it if we're going through treatment? So I think that resiliency training um, is really helpful. I think that having a team that you know you have faith and trust, I think, is helpful. Um, the resiliency training begins uh, with maybe receiving acupuncture, doing uh, addressing the emotional distress, and then uh, teaching them how to uh, do do breathing techniques uh, or relaxation response or mindfulness exercises. That's just the beginning. Um, and 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 some people may benefit. Actually, there are therapists who are specialists in um, working with cancer patients. And, um, and I think that can be helpful. But like I said earlier, um, I think if it was a medication form, people would say, Oh, give it to me. But in terms of uh, avail patients availing this, I think that I've noticed that um, patients who are what Dr. Bernie Siegel calls exceptional cancer patients, or self like fully self empowered patients, those patients, I think, do better. And they will make uh, avail of all these uh, tools. It's the other patients who um, are not able to fully engage. Then I think that uh, having a therapist, having support groups that, uh, and in in our case, one on one nurse navigation, I think can be very helpful. It sounds like if you're not open to everything possible. Uh, possibly available to you that maybe you don't have as good a chance. Is that fair? Yeah. I, what I sh- share with people is that it's like going to school. If you go to school um, or your child or grandchild goes to school and your child decides that I'm not going to do any homework, I'm not going to attend classes, would you be surprised if that person flunks out? No. Would you be surprised if the kid says, hey, um, I talked to the teacher, I, I told let the teacher know that I want to do well in this class, I ask the teacher what I need to do, what the expectation is, and before going there, and I do my preview, I listen and take notes, and I do review, um, and and I study, and I get whatever help, uh, what I don't understand, uh, I ask my teacher. Um, of the two people, you would say the latter has a better choice. Yet, I think we have a hard time believing that pa- patients who possess capability, capacity of latter patients would do better and that surprises them but in life it, it shouldn't surprise you right? that's what i think uh, good point what about cancers that can't be cured but they can be treated as chronic diseases how do you deal with that so again uh, looking at the advancement uh, there is a certain uh, form of blood cancer with uh, medication called glevac the, the cancer goes in remission so that time, about 20 years ago, MD Anderson talked about the idea that cancer can be a chronic illness. And I think we're seeing more of that where it cannot be fully cured. But um, And certainly I have had patients who communicate with me. It's been six years. Uh, I'm still alive. Stage four cancer. It's been six years. Um, the, the no evidence of disease. Uh, and times five more years, they're in remission. So I think that the, the, the idea uh, is that outcome is not always positive and outcome of life is death. What cancer does, it, it compresses lifetime into much shorter amount of time and it forces you to think about the mortality. So I think that people who, um, who can embrace that and still want to get everything they can get out of it. Those people tend to do better. So what I'm looking for are people, um, are they, are they proactive? Can they, do they have the self-discipline? If they don't have it, are they willing to get it? Through therapy or? Or whatever means. It doesn't have to be therapy. It can be prayer. It can be 
Um, but I, I, and the other part is that it has to be mindful. I think that um, I've only seen one patient who had blind faith that worked. Um, and it's a bit humorous because the patient told me that he doesn't have cancer. So I said, why do you take the chemotherapy? Well, I trust my doctors that they say I have, uh, I should take it. So I take it, but I don't have cancer. So I, what's your plan? I'm going to hunt and fish until I die. And uh, he did not die. <laughs> he had stage four <laughs> disease, well, but he said, no, no, I'm in denial. I'm not, I don't have cancer. Uh, that they are wrong about this. And, and, but, but in behavior, he's still taking the chemotherapy. It's like, why are you doing this again? He says, because I trust my doctor, but I do not have cancer. And I'm going to uh, do hunting and fishing because that gives me happiness. There you go. The ultimate mind over matter, right? Um, Dr. Kim, can we just talk real quick about some myths and what's true, what's not? Uh, we hear a lot about soy for maybe breast cancer patients or prevention. What's the story on that? Soy is a bit complex. Uh, if you get exposed to soy early in your life uh, as a woman, uh, it seems to be protective. Overall, soy appears to be protective. So um, I would say soy is uh, protective if you have estrogen positive cancer. The reason is that it works as a soy, soy can work as a, or component of soy works as a weak uh, phytoestrogen, estrogen from plant. So, so it can be used if a woman has no estrogen, some of that eating enough soy can give them relief from lack of estrogen. The, the, the concern is that is estrogen positive is using weak uh, estrogen like soy going to stimulate the cancer. The evidence uh, so far suggests otherwise. So um, I don't put restrictions. The only thing I do ask is if you're going to eat soy, eat the real food, not, not the soy protein. Um, I, uh, uh, I think that whole food closest to natural form has more benefit and less side effect. So don't get the processed. Um, I mean, for years we've been hearing about turmeric or turmeric, people say it differently. Um, is that still a good anti-inflammatory or is it helpful for prevention in cancer? So I've actually, my team and I, uh, while I was with uh, Miami Cancer Institute, we've written an article, published it, talking about does curcumin, uh, which is uh, uh, the act believed to be active component of turmeric, can, that, can we use that to treat cancer? And the answer was that there were many studies, but none of them were convincing. One of the things that looked interesting is that curcumin did look like it may be protective for GI cancer, protective, but not uh, for treatment. There were some interesting studies, but um, so it'll be interesting to, to look at it. And they're looking at derivatives of curcumin or making curcumin uh, more bioavailable, meaning uh, it, it, m m more uh, active in the body, because one of the difficulties of curcumin is it's not very bioavailable, but it's safe. You can take up to eight grams a day. Oh, is it a good anti-inflammatory in general, even if you don't have cancer? I think it's an excellent anti-inflammatory. Um, in my coffee, uh, I used to put turmeric and uh, cinnamon, uh, 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 cinnamon to uh, for blood sugar control properties, a uh, turmeric for the properties of uh, anti-inflammatory. We're hearing a lot about medicinal mushrooms. What is the real story? So the uh, medicinal mushrooms, there are many, many groups, but uh, the study, story is very interesting. It's very interesting because um, it appears to modulate the immune system. So if the immune system is too active, it has the capacity to uh, make it more towards normal and it uh, its immune system is not uh, working as well then you can utilize uh, the medicinal mushrooms to stimulate um, it's it's I think that it's one of the most promising uh, along with curcumin promising but not necessarily proven but for my patients I do recommend both uh, especially when they're done with active treatment, uh, curcumin to tr uh, to uh, reduce inflammation, and medicinal uh, 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 mushrooms to modulate. And then there's one more thing, uh, which is uh, low-dose naltrexone, which I recommend to all my cancer patients 
um, because I think it, that that does the same thing, which which is uh, it it modulates the immune system, calms down the immune system if it's hyperactive, and if it's not functioning as well as it should, then it stimulates it. Well, this is a lot of useful information to digest. Is there anything else you'd like to add that maybe we didn't cover? Uh, yes. Uh, what I recommend is that look for an integrative uh, oncology expert in your area. Um, and like for uh, for our services, uh, Memorial Hospital located in Carthage, Illinois, our services are um, included uh, in your, uh, we, 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 we take insurance to make it accessible. If you go to MD Anderson, they have integrative medicine services. Uh, if you go to MSK, they offer integrative medicine services. So more and more integrative medicine within in oncology or integrative oncology is uh, more being standard of care. So look for it, uh, ask, and, um, and be committed to your own outcome. Thank you so much for shedding some light on integrative oncology and treating the whole patient. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Again, that's Dr. Yoon Han Kim. If you'd like to learn more, please visit mhtlc.org. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels and check out our entire podcast library for topics of interest to you. I'm Maggie McKay. Thanks for listening. This is a podcast from Memorial Hospital. Thank you.